Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Thanks, De Am I on? Thank you. Thanks, Deirdre. And thanks to everybody for having me. Um, I, I thought, you know, I'm coming to Microsoft. I really need to do something other than just like stand here with my book open and read words I've already written. Um, so, I, so I put together a little Prezi um, just with some of the kind of the main ideas of the book and some of the kind of the stranger places it goes. Um, I did a lot of it at like four in the morning. Um, in kind of a, uh, I'm coming from the East Coast, so I, in kind of a time-shifting haze. So this is actually the first time I'm really going through this, so um, bear with me. Um, I think it'll make sense. So as you just said, I'm uh, Greg Topp. I cover education for USA Today, and I got interested in this, um, in this topic a couple of years ago when I actually had a conversation with one of my daughters about her relationship to books. And what I found was that she did not have a relationship to books. Um, she was a straight A student who didn't like to read. And I thought, this is a puzzle. Um, I, I need to look into this. So I actually started um, investigating essentially what, what you might call sort of the, um, the media ecology of, of her generation. Um, and what I found very quickly was that the one piece of media that really um, was becoming sort of more powerful and more central to young people's lives than anything else was video games. Um, and as soon as I started talking to teachers who were using games and game designers who were using games to, for education, I went down this complete rabbit hole, um, a place that I'd never been before, talking about stuff that I'd never seen. Um, the, the thing I tell people is that when you're an education writer, people invite you into their school. And the, 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 the invitation goes like this. Please come to our school. This is the coolest thing you will ever see. And you go into the school, and five minutes into it, you're looking at your watch saying, get me out of here. It's the worst ever. But when I started uh, looking at games, um, I was just amazed again and again and again. Every time I went into uh, check out a classroom or check out a game design studio that was doing something with education. I was just amazed. So that's kind of the, the genesis of the book. Um, and, and this is the cover of the book. Um, if you don't have it, <clears throat> they're for sale for $10 in the back. Um, so the rea I've had three reactions to this book, basically. So the first reaction is this one, which is, yeah, I get it. Great, go for it. Let's talk, OK? Um, people, some people get it, and they're very excited about it. Um, the other reaction I get is kind of total mystification. They don't know what the hell I'm talking about, and they can't imagine how this would work. Um, and then the third reaction is, you must be joking. Um, and this is the reaction I want to talk about today. Um, people who. For, for one reason or another, feel like we have just given up uh, the ship by matching games with learning. Um, so, you know, this is like most people's idea of, game, of kids in games, right? They're just like, they're just insane. They're jumping on the furniture. They're out of control. Or they're totally zoned out, right? Um, or even worse, they're like, borderline psychotic, okay? And so these are like, you know, even like, even like people who should know better, this is their idea about kids and games, okay? And one of the things I wanted to do with this book is just kind of present another um, frame of reference for people. So, you know, when you look at a picture like this, you know, a lot of people will look at this and say, ugh, you know, we've really just like, we've given in to the things that kids love in kind of this awful, way, you know, why are we giving kids iPads? Why does technology have to be in the classroom? You know, what is the point? You know, I didn't learn this way. Why do they need to learn this way? 
Um, you know, and what I've decided is like, it's a problem we adults have with buttons. Um, we do not trust buttons, right? Um, you know, we think people who press buttons in a rapid fashion are just like losers and slackers with nothing to show for it at the end. Um, and you know, like our culture, I think, really kind of gives us that role model again and again and again, right? Um, so it's kind of a hard sell in some ways. You know, the, um, the, the phrase I use in the book, um, the, um, one observer you know, was looking at sort of the way kids get when they're playing games and they use the phrase blinking lizards. You know, they're just kind of like totally mindless. Um, but there's like this other, there's this other point of view about games. And I'm sure some of you are familiar with this, but if you're not, I want to kind of introduce you to this. So um, is anybody familiar with this guy, Jesper Yule? He's a game theorist, game designer, has written some really interesting books. And he was one of the people that I, um, that I discovered while researching the book. And really, he really changed my mind about, about the essential thing that's happening when kids play games, or when anybody, when, you, when we all play games. Um, and here's his, he's got two main points. Both of them, I think, are really equally important. So the first one is that failure is key. When you're playing a game, you expect to fail. You may not like it, but you expect to fail. And that's like the key part of the game, right? So you may not like it while you're failing, but if you don't fail, it's not a game, right? Um, there are experiences that basically are fair. They give you a fair chance, even when the rest of the world isn't, OK? When you think about the games that you love, like there's a, there's a kind of like a basic fairness about them that if you just like keep up with it, if you keep persevering, you know, it's kind of like the ultimate meritocracy, right? You will succeed. It may take a long time. You may fail again and again and again, but you can keep hitting that reset button until you succeed. Um, and he's, you know, I mean, this is not, he's not the only one saying things like, you know, that good games are easy to use and incredibly difficult. Um, but this is the idea that I like as, almost as much as anything, that for something to be a good game and to be a game at all, we expect resistance. We expect it to kind of fight back, right? We want it to fight back, in it, as a matter of fact. And if it doesn't fight back, we're like, well, what's the point, right? So his, um, oh, oh, wait. So his, his, the way of, the way of um, expressing this idea in, in, in one of his books, he says, imagine a game where you couldn't fail at the game, OK? Um, this would be it, right? You'd, you'd open your phone or your tablet or your computer, and there'd be a button. And the button would say, press button to complete game. You couldn't fail at this game, right? So like, there's no child on earth that would play this game, right? This is like the stupidest game ever. Um, this is the second idea, which I think I want to spend just a minute on this and make sure you understand, because I think this is actually an even more important idea. Um, so we are not necessarily disappointed if we find it easy to learn to drive a car, but we are disappointed if a game is too easy. So, I would wager, and somebody can push back on this if you want, I mean, I, I would say that video games may be the only thing in our lives where we're disappointed if they're too easy. Um, did, oh, you? I would say the other place where you fail a, a lot is playing chess. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and we'd be disappointed if it were always too, if it were too easy. So I think yeah. Right, if you're playing, a, if you're playing a, a kid who's just learned how to play chess, right. it's not a very fun game. Match, right, you, yes. yeah, you could win in three moves. Play, no matter how good you are generally. Okay, but I think, I, I think it, you, so your point would, I think, be but true here. It's the only thing I'm saying chess is also that way. No, you, oh, okay, good point. So let's say a good game, forget video game. Um, so <laughs> our kids, like, get this, right? Our kids get that. A good game's got to be difficult. It's got to push back. It's, it, they're disappointed if, if the game is too easy. Um, I just picked on these two kids because I love their expressions. Um, but like in school, this is not the case. Like in school, they have not discovered this yet. 
Um, and obviously, I'm making a generalization, but there's a lot of research that shows that for many, many kids, school is kind of too easy. Um, so Indiana University does this survey every couple of years um, of high schoolers, and they found in the latest one that 65% of students were bored at least every day in class, and 16% are bored in every class. Um, another report, it's kind of old by now, but um, it's about dropouts, and it found that 8 in 10 high school dropouts said they did less than an hour of homework a night, and two-thirds said they would have worked harder if more had been demanded of them. Um, if you read a really interesting book that came out a year or two ago, um, Amanda Ripley's book, The Smartest Kids in the World, one of the things she did was she followed a bunch of um, foreign exchange students who came to America and a bunch of American exchange students who went to other countries. And what they, she found was that when she surveyed them, nine out of 10 of these kids said classes here were easier than at home. And seven of the 10 Americans agreed classes here are easier than they are in these other places. Um, so and this was her kind of takeaway, that school in America was many things, but it was not, generally speaking, all that challenging. The evidence suggests that we've been systematically underestimating what our kids can handle, especially in math and science. Um, these kids are like bored. They're like waiting for something to happen. Um, sorry, and I was picking on those two, so here's another pair of kids with, who are equally bored. Um, so it's as if we're asking them like, to like press that button, right? You know, that, that um, when they show up on Monday, I, you know, I would wager that most of them, like if they, were, if they got the option on Monday morning to press this button and be done, I think they'd do it. Um, but there's like another way um, that they're experiencing the world. And they're, you know, so many of them are gamers now, right? You know, and they have this experience that we've been talking about. You know, I just love this t-shirt. If you haven't seen this before. <laughs> That's a great t-shirt. I wish I had thought of that. I would have been. Um, so does anybody, how many people are familiar with this term? Anybody seen this term? We were just, like, just talking about it earlier. Raise your hand high if you know this term. OK. So hard fun. So this is an actual game design term. And Essentially, I mean, I'm going to, you know, I, I, will, I will bungle it, but essentially um, the basic meaning of it is that things like video games are not fun because they're easy. They're fun because they're hard, and they're often the most fun when they're hard. Um, they're challenging you bit by bit by bit, getting harder and harder and harder and giving you challenges that sort of step up little by little by little. Um, and this, you know, this is something kids are familiar with from a very young age, right? It's another word for like hard fun is kindergarten, right? You know, if left to their own devices, kids, you know, in situations like this, you know, they'll challenge themselves. They'll do hard things. They'll build towers, you know, higher than the one they built yesterday. Um, you know, uh, Friedrich Froebel, you know, the, the, um, the father of kindergarten, right? This was his kind of famous quote, right? Play is the work of children. Um, Nicole Lazaro, you know, we play to unlock our future selves. Play is sort of this natural way that we learn. Um, I like to think about, like, the way, the way that kids learn when they're doing things like this, you know, is they've got the hardware and they've got the software and they're sort of making it work, right? Um, is anybody familiar with Alan Kay? So really interesting guy. Um, uh, you know, he was thinking about these things 30, 40 years ago. Um, and one of the things that he decided we needed was something like this. So this is 1972. He came up with something he called the Dynabook. Um, and it was, in his words, a personal computer for children of all ages. And this, by the way, in, a, in an era when like, computers, like this was the punch card era, right? This was, this was way before anything even resembling, you know, something like that. So, but the key to, to me, this, the key to what Alan Kay was thinking of is that, you know, he had this idea that like a computer, a good computer that a kid would, you'd hand a kid, would be almost like a, like a, a piano. Um, and that they could just sort of noodle and play and figure stuff out, you know, whether it's math 
or language. Um, they could play with their schoolwork. Um, and of course, there's a longer quote than I needed to put up there, but um, you know, we need to give kids like something you know, enjoyable to do on the way to mastering this stuff. Um, he understood that a long, long time ago. Um, and one of the reasons I think he understood that was because he, like a lot of people in this era, you know, this is sort of like the, the I think the, the folks who kind of brought us the personal computer, I can't believe I'm standing at Microsoft talking about the, like the birth of the personal computer, as if I have something to tell you. But, um, you know, these guys played a ton. Um, so, you know, he was one of the key people in this, in this you know, space, you know, um, one of the first personal computers. But he also, by, by then, for 10 years, had been playing this. How many of you are familiar with Space War? Anybody? OK. So this was, I mean, some people say this was the first video game. Others would dispute that. Um, but it was one of the first um, video games. Um, and his, his great line was that Space War blossoms spontaneously wherever there is a graphics display connected to a computer, back in 1972. Um, so another guy who you, whose name may be familiar to you, Nolan Bushnell, I interviewed him a couple years ago. And I asked him, because he, he, he actually uh, writes and talks about space war and how space war was the thing that got him interested in computers. Um, and what he says, this was his quote, there was no question, again, OK, this is the time when like, you know, you're running processes um, and waiting for them to happen. You know, there was no question that when you pushed the rotate button, the ship would rotate. And when you fired a missile, it would fire. And when you observed the laws of physics, and when you thrust, the rocket ship would speed up. And if you wanted to slow it down, you had to turn the rocket ship around. This, by the way, is like a 72-year-old man. And reverse thrust, wow, that was just magical. Okay, So he, of course, is the guy who came up with this. Um, again, you know, more than 40 years ago. Um, so these guys were like playing at the same time they were working, right? Um, and I, I think that that's a key piece of this pie that like a, a lot of people don't appreciate. Um, so I started the book thinking in, in those terms, like you know, how can play work alongside work, and how 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 can um, you know how can playing kind of make kids' lives a more serious place. Um, and the other thing that I came upon was, um, by the way, I love this. Does anybody get the joke here? OK, you get the joke. Um, does anybody not get the joke? So 10 years ago, this would have been, if you see someone drowning, save them, right? This is a drowning person. And now it's if you see someone drowning, laugh out loud, right? LOL. Um, so, you know, I, I mean, one of the things that, that to me, you know, held like this incredible promise was the idea of Moore's Law. Um, and again, I can't believe I'm standing here talking about Moore's Law to, to a group of uh, engineers. Um, so, you know what Moore's Law is. Um, but, you know, I heard about this for years and I didn't quite understand it. Like, I didn't quite get why it was so important. So, um, while I was doing the research for the book, I came across some writing um, by Ed Lazowska at the University of Washington. Um, and it was the most amazing thing. You know, he, I emailed him and I said, you know, I've, re I, I've, you know, I've written or, or I've read your writing about this, um, but it's a, co a couple of years old. By then it was about maybe 15, 20 years old. He had actually testified um, in front of Congress about Moore's Law of, of all things and, you know, why it was important to kind of think about where it had taken us. And I said, have you updated this research at all? Like, do you have any like, new ways to help us understand, like, you know, going from like, the 70s to now, like, what it really means to like, your, your, your civilian? And he wrote me back the next day and said, well, actually, I just crunched the numbers with a couple of colleagues, and here's what we found. And I had asked him, I said, please don't like, give me just the numbers. Please. Like, can you, can you give me an, al an analogy that people will understand? And he said, yeah, I can do that. So, um, so here are the numbers, right? You know, it's much more dense. But, oh, by the way, it's these, so these are the two chips he's comparing, OK, uh, at the top. And I think that was the, 
the second one, is it like 2012 or, is that right, 2012? Okay, so it may even actually be even greater by now. Um, so all these, you know, incredible increases in density, speed, efficiency, and cost effectiveness. So they're, they're faster, smaller, cheaper, and more efficient. Okay, here's, here's what he found. He said, let's, let's think about if you had a car in 1971, okay? Your beloved Camaro, okay? So you know what this thing could do in 1971. Let's, let's like take it up to 2012. So it can now go six million miles an hour, same car. It can get you to the Earth to the moon and back in five minutes. Um, it can get you from New York to San Francisco on a half a cup of gas. That's how efficient it is. Um, it's cheaper now. It costs $9. And my favorite one, it's as big as the head of a match. OK. So like, like things have changed like in this incredibly important way. Well, well, not while you weren't looking, but while the rest of us weren't looking, um, like this world has really expanded in terms of the opportunities to create tools for the classroom. Forget tools for everybody else. How about just focus on tools for the classroom? So the, ga the video game industry has, has responded, right? So we've got, oh, by the way, he says, um, the other comparison was, was a house. He says you could buy a house for the price of a nice bottle of wine, which I thought was great. Um, so the, the, like the video game industry has responded, right? And they produce these incredible experiences um, that if you've, if you've played them, you know how vivid and how wonderful they are and how just like engrossing. Okay, so there's Bioshock. I mean, these are just three random examples um, that you may or may not be familiar with. Um, has anybody ever played Trials? It's incredible. Hard fun. Talk about hard fun. I, I, so this is a, this is a, in a way, it's kind of a stupid game. All it is is you're just doing motorcycle time trials. You're just racing against the clock. And I, the, talk about, talk about um, failing. I, um, at one point, after I'd bought this version, um, I'd, I'd failed so many times on one of the levels that I went back and looked at the analytics. And it, it tells you how many times you've done a certain track and how many times you'd restarted it. And that's one track I had restarted in a couple of days. I had restarted it 1,800 times. <laughs> like, it's like, OK. And like, there was no comment from the game. The game didn't say, like, you loser, you know, go on to another track. So it didn't no judgment at all. So, so you know, so all right, schools, you know, in the meantime, you know, they, they're kind of getting it in a way. Somebody's getting the message, right, that computers are important, that we need more of them. Um, that they could be a valuable tool. I mean, that's a pretty breathtaking um, change there. Um, and the question is, you know, like, if you bring all these computers into school, we've got these people who worked and played. Um, we've got these tools that are just getting more and more powerful. Um, could, it, could, could these things make school uh, like a harder, more rigorous, more serious, more fun place, right? And the answer is kind of like no. The answer is that it, they haven't really done much of anything. Um, you know, these are NAEP reading scores, you know. And if you look, there's 1971, right? Um, they've, they've been fairly flat. Um, and actually, we just got the newest scores a couple of days ago, and they are actually still flat and down in some cases. Um, even though we've got these amazing, amazing tools. And one of the reasons that I kind of theorize that um, we're not getting the results we want from these amazing tools is that like, teachers like to be in control. Like teachers, you know, they'll, they'll like buy a new tool, um, but, but they don't want it to like interfere with their control. They want to be the one who's in control. Um, and they're like worried that um, they're worried that a tool like this is going to help them lose, is going to make them lose control. So is anybody familiar with photo math? Does anybody know that, that, that term, photo math? It's actually an app. It's a smartphone app. Um, I'm hoping this video will work. I think it should. Um, 
This is just their like their little YouTube promo 30 second video. I'm going to ask you to watch this um, and think about if you're like a seventh grade algebra teacher, seeing this, the sight of this, what it would mean to you. Okay, so just think about that for a second. Imagine you're a seventh grade algebra teacher. Okay, so let's cross our fingers and hope it plays. And it, the sound may be. There's some music on it. If, if we can turn the, the sound down while we're playing it so it doesn't blow out the speakers, the music is meaningless. Ready? We okay? Okay. You see it? Bingo. Solve the problem, x equals eight. X equals five over two, watch this, ready? This is even better. It shows your work. <laughs> you can buy this today. You can pull out your phone while you're sitting here watching me and I think it's actually free. <laughs> <laughs> Not after they've seen this. Um, I, I showed that to, um, to the, I, I, when the book came out last uh, spring, I showed that video to the National Association of State Technology Directors. <laughs> so these are the guys who like buy technology for the public schools, the whole country, and, and they wanted to see it again. <laughs> we were like, we watched it twice. Um, anyway, so like the game is up. Like, like to me, like teachers have to figure out a new way to, to not only like interact with their students, but they need to, I love all these people on their smartphones. I think they're all like buying this app here. Um, like they have to figure out like what their, what their role in life is at this point. I mean, I, I'm glad I'm not a teacher in some ways because I think it's, you're, you're a teacher at a, on, on the one hand, a very exciting time, but also at a, a kind of a, kind of a hazardous time. I mean, your role is just sort of exploding in front of you. Um, so, so, the last thing I want to do here is just give you a, a little taste of a couple of the, um, the tools that I talk about in the book. Um, and then I might, if, if, if there's time and if there's even a desire, I might read a little bit about one of them. Um, so these are people, like I said, you know, at the beginning, you know, I'd met these folks and found out what they were doing and was just sort of amazed that they're thinking about school in so many different ways. So this is a, a tool called Interstellar. This was, um, designed by a guy who was a, a former rowing coach, and he found that when students were doing, like their, um, in the, the, when they were in the gym doing like, um, uh, you know, like the push-ups and pull-ups and, you know, all, all the, all the uh, warm-up exercises, that they, you know, they were pushing each other to get their personal best, you know. Yesterday you did 50 push-ups, this, this week do 60. Um, and what he came up with was, a piece of software that allows a teacher or a school or a school district um, to pit kids against kids doing you know, whatever it is, math, um, science, um, spelling, whatever content you want, and have basically a live competition, okay? So you can do like a 10 problem math quiz, and you can get like one class in a school doing it against the other class, and everybody's got a scoreboard, and the scoreboard moves in real time. Um, and they're, they're actually doing, um, if you look them up, they're actually now going through, they're in this, I think their third year of doing like NCAA style, like brackets. They've got schools competing against one another. Um, fantasy geopolitics. So this is a, a Minnesota uh, social studies teacher who realized that his kids didn't know where any countries were in the world and didn't really give a damn. Um, so he invited them using like the, the um, the mechanics of fantasy football to pick a team of countries totally unrelated. You know, you can pick, you know, Ethiopia, Mexico, and Iceland. And depending on how much they got in, in the news of the world that day, um, their rank went up or down. And his funny story is that um, the first country that everybody wanted was Djibouti. <laughs> um, and then they realized that Djibouti didn't make any news. 
Um, but so he, essentially what he was doing was sort of gamifying reading the news, right? Because the kid who comes in the morning, uh, you know, that there's a, you know, an earthquake in Chile or a, you know, a, a revolution in Mali, you know, can grab that country and pull ahead. Really interesting. He's doing really well, actually, with this game. And people are just adopting it um, like mad. Um, this, you guys ought to, this ought to warm your hearts. Um, this is a music instructor at Virginia Tech who got a group of uh, high school-aged boys together uh, a year and a half ago. And they started composing an original opera in Minecraft. And you can actually, you can go, they built the set. She, her, her problem was that she couldn't afford a set. So she said to one of her colleagues, there's got to be like some way we can do this virtually, right? And he's like, well, yeah, there's this thing called Minecraft. And so they actually built the set totally, by the way, remotely. They were all at their own houses building it together. Um, and and they, they, they used um, Mozart arias. Um, and they basically just like rewrote um, the lyrics and created this original opera. And they performed it. Uh, you, you can go on YouTube and see them do the first act. It's really interesting. They basically, basically like opera karaoke because they had the characters um, mouthing the lyrics and moving to the music. And th but they also had real singers on the side of the stage. So you're watching the action take place on, on a screen with the, with the singers on either side. Really fascinating. Um, this is actually a, a kid who, was, who um, went to DigiPen, which is not too far away from here. So this is a kid I met, a um, young game designer who grew up with ADD and um, wanted to get off the, the, the drugs that you take um, to control it. And so he came up with this um, a headband. Well, he, he, he adapted a, a headband um, that other game designers had been using to control your focus um, and your calm. And the more focused and calm you are, the more powerful you become in the game. And th th um, the basic gist of the game is that he found that nobody was really interested in like just being calm and focused on a screen. What they wanted to do with their calm and focused was kill the other player. <laughs> so, um, so it's a multiplayer game where you're basically throwing junk at the other guy. But, but, but the only way to do it is to be like zen calm. Um, and it's really fascinating. I've played this game, and it works. It absolutely works. Um, he, he tells this great story of developing it. He, was in the, he, he, he's, um, he graduated from DigiPen a couple years ago, and he moved down to Palo Alto. And he was sitting in um, Phil's Coffee, if you're familiar with Phil's Coffee. Um, and he would just be sitting there coding this game for, you know, with this crazy headband on his head. And he would turn every once in a while to like the guy next to him. And he would say, um, excuse me, sir, would you like to throw trucks with your mind? And as he reports, like everybody wanted to throw trucks with their mind. Like, you know, who doesn't? So that's where he came up with the name of the, the game. And you can see this actually on YouTube too. And you can buy the, the game and the headband for, I think it's like 60 bucks now. Um, and as, as he says, it's cheaper than a bottle of Ritalin. Um, um, Classcraft, you may have heard of this one. This is by a Canadian um, developer. He and his brother, um, really interesting story. They, he's a physics teacher. And what he decided was that, you know, so you're a physics teacher. Like, you have the top kids in the school, right? Because you don't get to be taking physics unless you're a pretty good student. And what he decided was even his top students, even the kids who are, like, doing well in school, Grades to them, A, B, C, D grades, were totally meaningless. Um, so he came up with this kind of alternate, like shadow government, if you will, where um, uh, the, the only thing that matters is your, your ability to keep you and your guild members alive. The, he plays it in groups of four or five. And everybody's got a different role in their little mini guild. So if this were a class, you, know, you guys would be a guild. You would be a guild. You would be a guild. And you're not so much fighting against each other as just trying to stay alive. Um, so if you, know, if, if you don't bring in your homework one day, you know, she can rescue you. Um, or you know, if you're, you, you, know, you do really well in something and want to share the wealth, you can share it with everybody else. Um, 
And this is, this again is another product that's going really great guns. Um, people are absolutely hungry for stuff like this. Um, and then the final one, which is to me kind of the most amazing, um, is Tracy Fullerton at USC, um, a game designer who you guys may, may already know, um, is working on and I've been, is about to release, I think maybe this spring or summer, um, her version, 3D, interactive, first person, um, totally accurate, photorealistic Thoreau's Walden. Um, and you basically play the game as Thoreau um, in Walden. Um, and there's no real like win state. Um, there's no way to lose the game. You just essentially um, see if you can play as kind of close, see if you can live life as close to um, Thoreau as you can. Um, and if you, if you don't want to, that's fine. If you want to, as she says, you know, there are opportunities to like be a businessman and be like, you know, like a Walden millionaire if you want to. And that's fine too. You just, you, it'll, you'll just come up with a different outcome. Um, this game is taking years, taking like seven or eight years to develop. Really beautiful. They used Thoreau's sketches. They used his surveying um, calculations. Um, their sound designer, my favorite detail about this game is their sound designer lives up there, lives up um, near Concord, Massachusetts, and wasn't satisfied just having like canned sounds, like, you know, you know, canned birds or wind or rain or whatever. He actually has spent two, maybe now even three years, um, recording the sounds of Walden. And uh, the, the funny story he told me was that he, um, he really wanted to get it right. So he took his recordings of bird song to the local birding group in, in, um, in Concord, and he played it for them. And, and they said, um, they're cardinals. You can't have cardinals. And he said, why not? They're, they're cardinals on my tape. He said, well, yeah, but they weren't there in 1845. So get rid of them. Um, so this, and this is like actually one of my favorite quotes of all, and I think this sort of, the way it sort of encap encapsulates the, the kind of the, the, the different way, I think, to think about what you're doing in this space. Um, so Jody Aswell Clark is um, a scientist who's leading this group that's developing a bunch of math and science games. And what she said is, we're not trying to, try, trying to turn your students into gamers, we're trying to turn your gamers into students. Um, and I really think that, like, that is, like, once people get that, I think they get what's going on in this world. Um, and I think we're done. Leave you with these guys. Um, I can, if you want, I can take questions now. I can read, there's a chunk of a chapter I wanted to read you just describing one of the um, math games that I really like. Um, I can do either one. Who wants to hear the chapter with the math games? And who wants to ask me some questions? All right, math games. Is it okay if I keep these two on the board? Is that all right? Um, so the, the reason I wanted to read this, um, and it's just, a, just like two chunky paragraphs, or, um, is because people like don't quite believe it when I describe some of these when I describe some of these games and when I talk about kind of how they're built and what they do. Um, so there's this one game that's actually, you may have even heard of it, you may have even, if your parents bought it for your kids, um, it's, a, it's a game called Dragon Box. Is that name familiar to anybody? Okay, um, well then, wait till you hear about this. Um, so there's this uh, French, French game designer and, and educator um, named Jean-Baptiste Huyn, and he actually, uh, wanted to develop games for, um, for his children. He's got three young kids. And his wife, who's a child psychiatrist, said, no, screens are bad. I don't want my kids on screens. Um, you know, electronic games are terrible. They're, they're melting our kids' brains. So she had all these sort of, you know, ideas about this world. Um, and she was the wife of a game designer, okay? And so, he's, so he, the story he tells is, like, he pleaded with her to let him do this. And he said, listen, I'll tell you what, we'll make a deal. If you let me do this, I will make this game go by very, very fast. That you won't have to play this game very long before you get to the end and get the concepts. And she said, all right, go ahead. And he, and he created this game called Dragon Box. 
there have actually been three or four, and he actually just came out with a, a new one just the other day, which is just absolutely mind-blowing. If you've ever seen it, it's called um, Dragon Box Numbers, and it teaches number sense to, um, to very young children um, in a very weird, creative way. So I'm going to read you just the description that I, that I end the chapter on math games with. Um, the, the description of Dragon Box. I want to make sure we're doing okay on time. What time is it? Are we okay? Have a few minutes? Okay. This will go. This will go fast. So, um, so I describe I, the, the, basically the chapter uh, where I describe these math games. I describe three games, and, and it's called Math Without Words. And what these three games all have in common that I that I talk about in the chapter is that they essentially try to teach complicated math concepts with almost no words at all. Um, and they do, it, they do it pretty well. Um, so uh, this, is my this is my description of how Dragon Box works. Imagine you have an iPad or some sort of tablet, it's a tablet game, um, and you've downloaded this. <coughs> Let me just get some water. Dragon Box has undergone several modifications and expansions since it first appeared. A new version which tackles geometry came out in the spring of 2014, but it's still lovely, mysterious, and a bit off-center. One critic, Forbes games writer Jordan Shapiro, praised it as, quote, praised its avatars that were simultaneously sweet and a little twisted. <clears throat> the game presents players with an odd little scenario. A mysterious box arrives for no apparent reason with a wide-eyed, omnivorous baby dragon inside, packed in straw. Also, for no apparent reason, the dragon wants to be alone. He must be alone before he'll eat. Don't ask, just play. The game board is divided into two sides, with your little dragon in a box on one. On both sides are cards, in quotation marks, random images of lizards, Horn beetles, deep sea fish, and angry tomatoes. Again, don't ask. To win each level, you must touch and tap and drag the cards to get rid of all of those on the dragon's side. Once you do, he noisily eats everything that remains on the other side, and the level is done. The box is alone, the game declares. The game is strange, but you keep playing. Soon you're, soon you're encountering night cards, in quotes with darkened versions of the creatures that you learn will soon stand in for negative numbers. Pretty soon you're strategizing which cards to get rid of first. Order of operations, anyone? On level 12, one of the animal cards has mysteriously been replaced by a little black A. Five levels later, there's a C. Finally, on level 18, the little wooden dragon box is momentarily replaced by a floating letter X. You're doing proto-algebra, and it's been about three minutes since you downloaded the game. This strange procession continues through 100 levels with no explanation or elaboration. Addition, multiplication, division, fractions, all of them appear without fanfare or explanation. You play 60 levels before an equals sign appears between the two sides of the board. By game's end, at level 100, You've moved seamlessly, baby step by baby step, from a cute baby dragon eating a spiky two-headed lizard to this. 2 over x plus d over e equals b over x, which you solve fearlessly and perhaps even a bit impatiently in exactly 14 steps. You are four years old. So that's a kind of a small taste of what's possible in this world. And, you know, I, I think it doesn't do everything, you know. A game like Dragon Box, it's not going to explain to a four-year-old or, or a 12-year-old, for that matter, like why algebra is important, um, where you'll use it, how you'll apply it. Um, but it does get them thinking algebraically um, in what I think is a pretty remarkable way. Um, so anyway, that's uh, a little bit, a little taste of it. Um, I'm happy to take questions, I'm happy to take um, comments. Uh, yeah. Is there like a microphone or do we, should we just, do we, we've got one here if you want. Are you, 
Do we need, do we need to, people to say who they are or does that not matter? Okay, so you don't have to say who are. So this is totally anonymous. All right. I am anonymous. Uh, uh, so I have uh, friends who are teachers in elementary, uh -huh. and uh, they try to stay away from student on student competition as yeah. much as possible yeah. um, because for the winners it works well, but for yeah. people who lose a lot, it, it has a negative side effect to it, right? Yeah. Um, so how would you, uh, could, could you talk a little bit about how bringing games into the classroom has an effect on, I guess, the competition within yeah. it? And I think that's a really good question. And, you know, and there's a way in which like, school is kind of like allergic to competition, I think. I mean, we're, you know, we're taught, I think, from a very young age that like, people's feelings are important. And you don't want to like, crush the other guy into the dirt. Um, I think, to me, like, the class craft example is a really good one. You know, um, uh, and, and actually, and also the other, the, the other example I think this really good one is, is the, um, the math tournaments, you know, like kid against kid, school against school. Um, I mean, what's built into it is, is a support structure um, so that even if you do badly, you know, there are other, your classmates are helping you out, you know, so that, so that you don't do as badly next time. Um, I mean, in the example of the, uh, the, um, uh, the class, or not the class graph, the um, interstellar, um, I mean, one of the things that he found was that um, if, you, if you pit school against school, it's a much healthier kind of competition because you've got people rooting for you because they want their school to do well, right? So even if you do badly, people aren't going to say, you know, oh, you know, you, you blew it for us. They're, you know, they're going to say, how can we do better next time? Um, I, I guess... To me, like competition, I mean, it, it's like failure. Like, if the failure is not the important part, it's how you react to it, right? So if you react to it with, you know, we'll do, we'll do it again, we'll do it better next time, I think, that, I think that can solve, like, a lot of our sort of abhorrence to competition. Um, I don't know, is that, I mean, is that a... Is well, that I guess, a helpful way to think about it, or I guess it, it, another way to, to think about it is if you're playing games at home yeah. and then you lose, then you try again. Right. But in a classroom, which is usually much more structured right. and is sort of time limited as well, it, if you're giving a sort of game, especially a competition, as a task, right. and then you lose, and then you're done. Right. That's sort of a different, uh, uh, a different and I, and reality I for and students. And I wouldn't recommend that ever. I mean, like for instance, like a spelling bee. I think spelling bees are like the most caustic, destructive things that ever happened in school. <laughs> right, I mean, it's like, that's like how most students experience competition in class, right? You know, w I mean, you can understand why spelling bees suck, right? Because like one mistake and you're out. Um, and I mean, I think there are, there, there are better ways to structure the competition. So if you only have, let's say you're a teacher, if you only have 40 minutes to do that competition, maybe you don't want Maybe you don't want it to run like a typical competition. Maybe you want to, I don't know, um, you know, make it so that uh, you know, the, the, the competition's over a larger period of time, maybe two or three class periods, so you're not like out and done and sitting there watching the rest of your classmates for the whole time. And I really think it's, it's, it's in how teachers like manage, manage the failure um, that I think really makes a big difference. But it's a, but it's a huge... So it's a huge issue, and I think if we don't like, come to terms with it, I don't think, I, I don't think people are going to like, find a good way to incorporate stuff like this into the class. I mean, like the class craft thing with the guilds, I mean, that, that's a, essentially a game that takes place over an entire school year. I mean, that's huge, you know, so if you're down one day, you may be up the next. So, any other questions? Yeah, way in the back. Hi, I was wondering if you could speak more about maybe some of the differences that, between genders, about how girls approach gaming versus boys approaching gaming. Because what we found is with Minecraft, we're finding that boys and girls both love Minecraft, mm -hmm. but they play it very differently. Mm -hmm. The boys are very enthusiastic about survivor mode, mm -hmm. and the <laughs> girls, um, the girls that I've interviewed, um, tend to like just the creating part and yeah. not the survivor mode. So, how do you no, incorporate in that into? other games and learning that you found? I mean, I, I think, I, to me, I think what you're finding is what a lot of people are finding. That I mean, and, it, and it, I hate to be like stereotypical about it, but um, what a lot of people that I've talked to have found is that um, 
girls like the social aspect of the games, a lot of these games better um, than the competition aspect of it. I mean, it's not a hard and fast thing, but it's generally, it generally tends to be kind of that's how it breaks down. I mean, actually, I, can I turn this around? Like, what else have you found <laughs> with, with like gender and Minecraft? I mean, yeah. I have, a, I have a very small sample size, yeah, so right. I can't say it's definitively that way, yeah. but we're, I'm mostly curious about how do we make learning and games approachable for girls and for boys. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, those are just the simple observations that we've had so far, but yeah. I'm still looking for more. Yeah, I mean, I mean the, the reporting that I did was basically like, it, you know, kind of like the, the, whole, the example of like failure in, in the classroom. Like, you know, how you, frame, how you frame the meaning of the game, I think, is really important. Um, you know, w one of the things that, that, that to me was like really exciting to see was that, um, you know, I mean, like a lot of things, you know, you'd go into a classroom and there would be some teachers who would be sitting there saying, you know, every kid's got their tablet or their computer, you know, and it's like eyes forward, you know, you, you know, you focus on what you're doing and don't worry about what the other guy is doing. There are actually some schools um, that have like, like build like, car uh, not cardboard, um, like plywood partitions between the, the desks so that what you're doing is what you're doing and what the other guy is doing is what he's doing or what she's doing and you're, you're not to like look at what they're doing. Um, to me, I think that can be dangerous. Um, t when I've been in classrooms and seen games at work, to me the most exciting moments or when kids are like looking over to see what the other guy's doing. Um, and just, you know, collaborating is kind of a funny word. I mean, they're just, they're just curious about each other, right? They just want to see what's happening. You know, did you get this? I couldn't get this. Can you help me with this? Um, I think, I mean, I think that's a behavior. I think that we, sh I think a lot of schools are, are kind of suspicious of that. But I think in games, I mean, if you're gamers, you know that like that's, how gamers behave, right? Help me with this. Can, I, can you help me get through this level? I keep getting killed here. Can you help me do this? Um, so I think teachers have to learn that just, just like everybody else. There's a question up front here. Deirdre didn't know she was going to be okay. like the Oprah, <laughs> the Oprah moment. Hi, so um, my kids are 12 and they have recently become totally addicted to some uh, shooting games. Uh -huh. okay. Is there anything redeeming? I mean, they do they do play as teams yeah. and they do have on um, headphones, they're listening yeah. to earbuds headsets. and headsets, so they're talking to other yeah. people. So there's some interaction and collaboration, yeah. but I don't know that the ratio matches, uh, that's a pretty low benefit. Uh -huh. So I wonder what's, if you could what's talk the, about... Can I ask you? Ciesco? What's that? Ciesco it's called? Ciesco. Oh, okay. okay. Okay, Counter-Strike, yeah, okay. Yeah. I always forget what it stands for. They're talking in code, so you yeah. don't know what they're doing. Um, I, I actually, I mean, I have, a, I have an answer that I like to give to that, I, and I'm not cheating here, but, you know, so you said an interesting thing. You said, like, is there basically like a, like a benefit to all this what, mayhem or, like, destructiveness or, I don't, I don't actually, I don't even think you used a noun in there. You just, you kind of left it implicit. Well, because um, it's a huge time sink, and it's right. really an addiction, and you know, you. I, ask I would a disagree with that word, there. by the way. Okay. But that's okay. Um, but I, I, let me ask. I want to do two things. First of all, I want to see if there's anybody in the audience who has an answer to that. In the back, because because I mean, I I do have a very strong opinion and a, and a thought about this, but I want to see. I, I'm I, the thing I should have said at the very top, um, is that I am not like a huge gamer. Um, I don't have a headset. I mean, I play some of these games very, very badly. But, 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 but I want somebody who can answer at least part of that question with real experience. So go ahead. You knew I was going to have an answer for this, right? Yeah, I you know, <laughs> can never tell. <laughs> uh, well, there's some great research from a neuroscientist named Daphne Bavallier, who's analyzed using fMRI machines the effects of action games, specifically games like Call of Duty, on the effects of the, the brain. And one of the things that she's found that I think is really fascinating is, is that people who play a lot of action games are, are much better at distinguishing uh, multiple objects moving around simultaneously. So mm -hmm. the ability for their retina-related multitasking systems in the brain to, uh, to operate efficiently is much higher. 
Um, and this has a bunch of interesting knock-on effects into working memory and, and mm -hmm. multitasking broadly. It's super fascinating research. I highly recommend it. So, so when you think Call of Duty and Counter-Strike Go, just think about multitasking and things like this. Yeah. So the researcher's name is Daphne Bavalier, yeah. and it's great stuff. I mean, I, thanks. And does anybody else have other actual gamers want to add something to that? Yeah, go ahead. Y you know, I grew up playing lots of video games, and my parents always hated it. And so I kind of bring it up to them now, like, hey, I'm a patent attorney at Microsoft. <laughs> you know, like, in your face, yeah. mom. Yeah. Um, <laughs> No, I just I, I think that the kids are going to do something they like. Server with to a do. summons, right? Yeah, say. exactly. Um, I don't think it's all wasted time. I think you could probably push them to to broaden the games that they play and try and 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 work on different skills. But ultimately, I feel like it led me to the path that I'm at now, and and I think that's positive. Yeah, that's great. No, I I mean I hear stories like, and I don't mean to like, you know, put you in a in a bell jar here, but I hear stories like that all the time wherever I go. Where, where, where the skills people learn, the kind of the attitudes, the, 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 the kind of the reference points, um, you know, we're, we're, th these skills are just huge um, later in life. So somebody else had a comment? Oh, I was gonna say, in, in particular, as it pertains to multiplayer shooters like that, yeah. um, and also to like MMOs, and basically yeah. any, any sort of game where you're playing with a team, mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I don't have researchers' names on off the top of my no. head, but uh, I, I, M most I, of us don't. So yeah, but, the next but I can. I, but I can definitely say that, that there has been research about the, the the collaborative aspect of it. So I mean, in a sense, yeah, they're shooting people in the face, but at least they're not doing it alone because the the, <laughs> the things the things that they learn in terms of. Uh, the, the cooperation and the yeah. teamwork, and particularly in terms of strategizing about breaking down a problem, those things do apply outside. Yeah. Um, and so in, in particular when they end up doing like craft projects together or things outside mm -hmm. of the CSGO space, like the, they, they will take away that sort of collaborative uh, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, no, I it's, that's it's one of the benefits to the gaming that we have now versus the gaming that we had when a lot of us were younger that was, you know, we didn't have networked computers as much, like right. it was primarily a more isolated space. A lot of the gamers that are growing up now in these massively connected spaces are, you know, much less isolated. I mean, I, I would say to add to that, I mean, that a lot of gamers I've talked to, that's why they play the game. I mean, all the rest is just kind of details. You, you had a question or comment about this and then somebody else wanted to talk about it. But yeah, I yeah. think I went on proximity. Uh, I was going to say, the, I'm, not, I'm not a gamer yeah. e either. Uh, my son's a gamer and mm -hmm. he does play a lot of first person shooter games and, other, and, and multiplayer shooter games as well. And I've never dissuaded him because I see him learning strategy. I see him learning how to control something mm -hmm. that's new and he can walk into a different game and pick that up too. Yeah. Like I wonder if we tried to teach the kids a language made out entirely out of swear words. It would be bad, but they could learn French a lot more easily after they learn that, right? Mm -hmm. So there's like some transferable skills. Yeah. And the other thing, <laughs> the other thing about that is um, like a lot of the, a lot of the things that we sort of project is, is yeah. really just fear on, on the part of parents. Like we don't worry that people who take kick, kickboxing classes are gonna go out and beat people right. up. Right. We worry about people shooting a pixelated weapon are gonna go pick up a weapon. I mean, right. I, I, Or that playing country music's gonna like make you break your heart in Yeah, life something or, like that. You know. But I guess the biggest reason <clears> of all is like, I, as a parent, I don't wanna tell him what not to do because he'll just yeah. wanna do that more. And uh, this is actually seems like a good gateway to other things he can do in a networked way online that are good for yeah. him and educational actually. Yeah, I appreciate that. And there's one comment in the lady in purple back here. And then I, and then I have one thing I want to say about that, and then we'll move on. Go ahead. Uh, just a brief comment. Yeah. One of the things that I noticed with my son when he started getting into video games, which was fairly late. Um, How old he, is he? He's almost 13. He's okay. only started in the last couple of years. Um, failure is a lot more comfortable for him. Mm -hmm. In general, you mean? In general, yeah. um, where before he would get very frustrated even when he was experimenting with Legos, that if it didn't go his way, it was just an emotional kind of a thing. Mm. And with the video games, it seems like, oh, well, there's another game, there's another game, I can do that. And so that that repeated failure, like you mentioned before, yeah. feels much more comfortable comfortable to him. Yeah. No, I think that's right. And I mean, and I appreciate all these remarks. I mean, one of the things that I, that, that, that um, my, my, my one like real insight into a first person shooter game, I played a lot of Bioshock about a year and a half ago while I was, while I was deep in the reporting and basically procrastinating and not wanting to write the book. Um, 
And one of the things that taught me was the strangest thing. I swear to God, I was braver as a result of this playing this stupid game. Well, I shouldn't say it's a stupid game. It's a really remarkable game. I was a braver person because I would have to go repeatedly into these crazy, you know, the doors open and there's seven people and they all want to kill you right at that very moment. And there's zombies and there's monsters and they've got guns and they've got claws and they just like, like having at you from the moment you walk in the room. And I, after a while, I just felt myself being like, okay, like I'm good with this. There's no consequences. I'm not really dying. You know, I, I can just like take the damage and just come back again. And it really made me feel like a braver person um, on account of it. I want to say one thing about the violence. Um, so the, the stupid thing I say when parents, and you, you, I mean, you have, I think, a pretty nuanced understanding of this. Yeah, I wasn't, the violence is not my Yeah, issue. okay. And I should add yeah. um, that there has been one concrete benefit. Okay. You ripped off on making trades twice. Uh -huh. Yesterday was their first self-advocacy. Interesting. Oh, nice. And, uh, wow. Talk about you have to be yourself, an advocate for yourself. Yeah. And I did see it. So yes, that's great. Win. <laughs> Good. OK. If you had asked me about the violence thing, this is what I would have said. Um, um, and it's a stupid observation, but I'll say it anyway, that when parents um, say, oh my god, these games are so violent. My kid is shooting. You know, He's going to become Ted Kaczynski or whatever. Um, what I say is we're focusing on only half the bullets, like because you're, when you're playing one of these games, you're not walking through the world just shooting everything that moves. You know, these sort of like you know harmless, um, defenseless creatures. It's not like you know it's not like Bambi. You know, on, on every level, like there are people shooting at you. So in a sense, it's sort of like a self-defense sort of hunting game in a lot of in a lot of situations. So if you if, if you're only focusing on the sh bullets your kid is shooting, um, you're missing half the point of the game. Um, but I but. You know, I hadn't, I'd never heard that the self-advocacy thing. I think it's really, really interesting. I mean, that's like a real-life skill, you know? Even though, like, the thing they were getting back was, like, a digital artifact, right? I mean, yeah, it's really interesting. Um, so, Greg, I, I think we need to actually close, close the conversation now so we have a little time for book yeah, signing. Okay. So thank you so much for coming. Sure, thank you. You guys have been great. <laughs>